We're going to continue in our series today, the AD series. Hopefully you're enjoying it. Some parts are intense. Man, but, the, but that was intense, the whole thing, the what, what historic happenings there. All right, how are you doing on uh, discerning, uh, discerning the historical reality as we understand it versus some of the fictional Hollywood aspects of it, right? I've had people ask, so where's Boaz in the Bible? <laughs> Boaz was not in the Bible, but Pilate was, and uh, Caiaphas, and so these are characters. But so there's some... Some of this um, unpacking of how it could, how it could have been, how it could have been. So we're going to continue uh, tonight's uh, episode. Should be an exciting one because it continues with uh, with more. It enters into the persecution, as we saw at the end last week. Did everyone catch that was Paul Saul collecting the coats at the stoning of Stephen? Did everyone catch that? No. Only one person's watching it. So did you catch that? That it was that, it was, that yeah. And so and not everyone would catch that, but it's okay. We're all kind of this, this. And I hope this is my hope. This is my prayer: is that you are reading Acts one through ten and becoming familiar with it more again. Maybe maybe you've read it a million times, but read it again and discover and kind of see what what God has to tell you uh, this time around. So today we're going to talk about just, I want to start with talking about last words. Last things that we say before we pass away. So what are some, it's not funny, Chuck. This is death we're talking, no, it is. I know you're getting ready for the punchline. It's like, um, have you ever thought about your last day on earth? What that would be like? And if you could plan your last words, what would you say? Um, but none of us, we can't. You can't plan your last words. And maybe you, on a serious note, maybe you were with a uh, loved one that, that passed and you know exactly what they said at the very end. And so Ecclesiastes 7.2 says this, better to spend time, uh, spend your time at funerals than at parties. Ecclesiastes, it does have a kind of depressed tone of of sorts, but it ends it with, uh, after all, everyone dies. So the living should take this to heart. And so considering um, funerals, funerals are for the living, not for the dead. Right? Funerals are for the living, not for the dead. And so for us that know the Lord, we know that it's a celebration. And I've often quoted this, and so you know, okay, pastor, you've quoted this before, but Clint Eastwood in the movie The Unforgiven said... We all got it coming, kid. We all got it coming. One of my favorite lines in a in a movie because uh, this young kid was so convinced that he uh, executed justice. We all got it coming, and Clint East was like, "Okay, you got it, something to learn. We all got it coming, kid." And so we all have, and then we're all going to see uh, see death. Don't be naive, but be ready. On, on kind of the, the last words, what will your last words be? You don't want your last words to be uh, the O's, right? They're like three O's uh, that could be your last words. Uh, like, ouch, that hurt? You don't want your last word to be oops. <laughs> or, oh no. Those, those could be your last words, but a few people will record those. Uh, so some famous last words are uh, England's Queen Elizabeth I said her last words were, all my possessions for a moment in time. That's telling. That's deep. Uh, evangelist Henry Ward Beecher, you may not be familiar, some of you may be, but uh, said, Henry said, now comes the mystery. Um, Hollywood mogul Louis B. Mayer said, nothing matters, nothing matters. That's depressing. George Washington, you ever wonder what he said right before? I didn't know this. This is new information to me. I, he, he evidently was a Bruce Willis fan because he said, I die hard. <laughs> but, but, but I'm not, I know, right? It's, I, I die hard, but I am not afraid to go. So that's the, he picks it up there at the end. 
Inventor Thomas Edison, I'm almost done, really. Uh, this reminds me of one of uh, some of our dear friends who has moved out of state now would sit on the, toward the front, and when I'd get to this point in the introduction, he'd be like this. <laughs> so he took my wife's spot when I do talks, and she's like, okay, give me. but these are fun, right? Okay, Inventor Tom, Thomas Edison said, it is very beautiful over there. He, he continued to envision things even at the point of death. Uh, John Wesley, pastor, theologian, um, father of the Methodist Church, uh, the best of all is God is with us. I like that one. And then this one, this is my, really my last one, uh, actress Joan Crawford, those that remember Joan Crawford, when her housekeeper began to pray aloud for her on her deathbed, she had um, an expletive that I won't say from the pulpit, and she followed that expletive with, don't you dare ask God to help me. I know, I know. The silence tells it all, right? Because you're all like, well, that's depressing. That's awful. But yeah, Joan Crawford. Who knew? She didn't like that one bit. Let's move from Joan Crawford, which is sad how she responded, the last words of Jesus. We have them, we understand them, and the last thing he said on the cross was, it is finished. It is finished. That term actually means that it is, it is complete, paid in full. The Greek term goes back to like a real estate transaction or transaction like um, the stamp of it's done. It's a done deal. Paid in full. Complete. It's done. That's how we can see that and read that. He has a second last word moment after his resurrection. So you remember Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he appears uh, back before the disciples and he gives the great commission. And so let me read the, his famous last words there. And that is, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Today, we want to talk about the pebble plan the pebble plan, which uh, includes this, with Jesus' terms, uh, Jesus' last words that he gave. The pebble plan is this, derived off of two verses, uh, both chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. We just have to find the book. Chapter 1, verse 8. The first one is chapter, as an illustration for the pebble plan, is going to be chapter 1, verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 8 says this. The Lord's, Paul is writing here. And he said, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we need not say anything about it. So the phrase there that we want to grab a hold of for this 1-8 in regards to what's called the pebble plan, which connects to Jesus' last words, is the idea of rang out. The words rang out is um, originally in the Greek, uh, our understanding is more of a ripple or like if a pebble was thrown into a pond, right? You have this calm pond, this lake or this body of water, and you throw a pebble in and you can see the ripples go all the way to the edge of the shore. That's that idea that it, the, the message went out in this area, and he's saying the message rang out. It, it ripples went out and not only hit in Macedonia, but it went beyond, and then it went everywhere. That is the pebble plan. It's similar to, I envision, um, like in my neighborhood, you look down the street, and I remember one day on a, on a summer day, it was clear, uh, someone was in their front yard, and they were doing work, and they started pounding on something, right? And I would look, and I would see this guy just, just pounding, doing some sort of work. I don't know what he was banging on, but it made a loud noise. But I would see the bang, but then I wouldn't, you don't see a bang, but you see him striking, but I heard the noise, delayed. It rang out, but it took a second to get to me or a millisecond or whatever that was to, to get to. 
So the effect, so the idea of the pebble plan is very similar where a message is spoken here, a, something happens here, and then it ripples out. I heard one time, and I don't know if this is true, and you may ask your device or whatever, however you find out the answers in life, uh, but I heard this about how sound travels, and people said one time that Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address is still floating in the air out there. That everything said is still out there. I don't know if that's true or not, but it seemed interesting. And it seemed connected to the fact that once a message is given, there is a, there is a delay, but it does ripple out. And sound does that. Sound travels and it goes. This message is the same way. Uh, the other one eight that we want to look at, obviously, maybe not so obviously, but uh, uh, obvious to me, we're going to Acts because that's where we're at, AD series. And so Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We've read this verse before, but we were going to go back and you say, oh, hold on, Stephen just got stoned, right? So, Not stoned. They stoned him. Sometimes it's just good to pause in a sermon to see what kind of response, the unplanned uh, comments that are made. Uh, so you say, well, this just happened, so we shouldn't we be like chapter 7 or whatever? And yes, hold on. Chill. We're going to get there, but let's go to one eight because one eight dictates where we where we go in chapter seven, eight, nine, ten, and so forth and so on. So, Acts one eight says this, and if you can imagine the pebble plan, the echo, the impact. But you will receive power, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right there, Acts 1.8, that is the pebble plan. That's the ripples going. What happens in Jerusalem then continues to ripple out from there. So be, before we go any further, let's see how this kind of all started. It's, and for, so tonight's preview video is what we're about to see. And it's Peter's kind of, you see how the story has gone for, so far. This is Peter's kind of challenge to his group. He's come to this epiphany. He's like, we need to preach and preach more. Let's go, let's go out there and get him. This is his locker room speech of sorts. And so let's see what happens tonight. Now, you may, you may not be, a, a, and I don't even know why I would have even apologized. I was about to say, I apologize for this, but you know, it's our, this is our uh, projector. It, we, it belongs to us. We apologize to one another. Our projector is not working well on this one. Everything's going to be yellow. So you may want to look over at this one. It's a little better screen for us today. So let's watch tonight's clip in light of the Pebble Plan. You have questions. You say, why did he call me his rock? You ask, am I the foundation? Is this where his church will be built? There is only one foundation stone, and his name is Jesus Christ. And his church is not here. It's not in those tents or these walls. It's you, all of you. You are his church. And like those, we ask to believe, even though they didn't see him rise again. We must push away our fear, even as we recognize the persecution we face. We have to go to Jerusalem and preach the word to build his church. Don't you want to just go now? I get excited. Now, we don't have that, that that's in, just in case you haven't read Acts 1 through 10, we don't have that specific speech sermon recorded, but we have the essence. I would not be surprised. That feels like, that sounds like something that Peter would have, he's kind of the character development in AD, the movie, you see character development in the in Acts as well, because you see a guy going from, so uh, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and Luke wrote the, the book of Acts, right? And so those two, it's like a part one, part two uh, series. And so you look at how character development of Peter through all of Luke's writings, um, and how you, this is the same guy that denied Jesus three times. This is the same guy that put his foot in his mouth time and time and time again, Right? 
And so talk about character development. This, this guy now is like moved, filled by the Holy Spirit and encouraging the church and saying, it's not about me, but you are the church. And so I could see this. I could, I could, I, although not in scripture, I could see that happening. Can you, can you see that? That same thing? I hope so. So there's what I want to, we want to do something a little academic here, slightly. Maybe for you it won't be, but it's just to explain how, um, so we see the ripple effect, the, uh, the pebble plan, the, how, how um, the message is here and then it goes out from there. Let's see how Acts chapter 1 verse 8 then looks like in the whole book of Acts. And so there are three phases and you have this in your notes. And if you could just look with me in your notes, uh, the, the going from from one phase to the other. So you can understand this helps may help with reading it as well. And so phase one, so look at Acts 1, 8, you have that right in your notes up at the top. So you can see the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. So let's look at phase one, Jerusalem, Acts 1 through 7 was the focus there. Disciples reached out with the gospel in their city, Jerusalem, the holy city. They would. Uh, they invested time uh, uh, in the metropolitan area, that the, the social area. And Jerusalem, by the way, at that time was very was very diverse in background of people. Now, this is critical for for later on, but meaning there were Jewish people coming to Jerusalem from all around the known world, and so they represented different ethnic groups. Uh, tr- tribes, languages, but they had this either God fearers or Jews. Those are kind of two different groups. So if you weren't born Jewish, you were, and but you followed the God of the Jews, you were a God fearer, is what they would call you. Okay, write that down. That's a freebie. And so they, so you had this whole group, and then that's going to play a critical role later on as we go from here. So Acts one through seven, disciples reached out to their city, and then phase two. This next ripple as it goes out, Acts 8 through 12, believers went out from Jerusalem to reach out to the surrounding area, Judea and Samaria, with the good news of Jesus Christ. What's interesting there is those are two different provinces of the nation of Israel, but they're not equal. We've, we've had this talk before, and if this is new to you, just a reminder that Judea was a, lot, a little more holy, a lot more holy than Samaria. Samaria was made up of a, a land of people who were known as half breeds and uh, turned their back on God. They really didn't. They didn't have it all together. You know, this is not. They're second class citizens, and so it's interesting that while this is, we've unpacked it before, but we'll just reiterate right now that this is. Um, it's significant that they say the gospel needs to go out to. A, a land beyond Jerusalem that's a little larger geographically, but includes more of the nation of Israel, um, much more of the nation of Israel. But then also it needs to go to people who are foreign to us, who are different from us, who we see as despised outcast people, but they are still geographically close by. And we could probably translate the same thing as that and so, and I hope you see where we're going with this. This is, and for many of us, this isn't a new message. And you, you, maybe I could be guilty of what uh, someone accused me of uh, in the past, where it said, "Pastor, just teach us something new. It's just, teach me something new. It's the same old thing all the time." Well, you know what? Is that a uh, gospel needs repeated over and over and over again? Because that's the centerpiece. And I'm, I'm not very good at teaching pop psych all the time, you know. So. I'll just go back to the central message, the foundational message. And that is, for here, the gospel going out to not only Jerusalem, but going out to um, Judea and Samaria, to people that are different from us within our, our region and our area. You translate that then into your world, what that looks like. And then phase three from Acts 1.8, then it goes to chapters 13 to 28. Believers went out even farther to the rest of the world, to the uttermost parts of the earth, in Rome and Greece and, and beyond. Rome and Greece and beyond. And so you see these disciples, that even Peter, who Peter's talking to in that clip there, you see them, that they, um, all of a sudden we're going to see tonight it illustrated, and you read in the book of Acts, persecution breaking out. 
And so you think about what happened. Let's jump forward then. What happened? And this, by jumping forward historically, it's going to give us an understanding on how this was fulfilled, right? Paul, we as a separate, the one standing there as Saul, before he changed his name, standing there holding the co- coats and approving of the stoning of Stephen. And he, in fact, in that, wasn't that powerful when he took that last stone and handed it to that guy and the guy threw the last one. And, and that's, that was, I think, symbolized really well of what it actually says in the book of Acts that Paul stood there watching the coats and approved of the killing. That was powerful, powerfully illustrated. So persecution breaks out, but Paul himself became a follower of Christ. We're going to see that uh, happen, actually, before we finish this series. And he went out, and he was eventually, he was imprisoned, we know, several times, but he eventually was beheaded in Rome, as our understanding. So our understanding of, of the record, a historic record, Peter was crucified in Rome, eventually, upside down, because he did not want to be, uh, he did not feel like he was worthy of being crucified in the same way that his Lord was. Andrew, uh, the disciple, was crucified in Greece. So pay attention to these locations, so Rome and Greece. Philip was hung upside down with hooks in his ankles in Phrygia. Matthew died in Ethiopia. Jude was clubbed in, in, to death in Iran, modern-day Iran. John died in exile on the island of Patmos, which is outside of uh, Turkey, that Mediterranean area. Bartholomew was crucified in our modern-day Armenia. Thomas was speared in India. James, or Alpheus, died in Egypt. Simon was sold in half in Spain. And Matthias was crucified in Georgia, not the one with, Atl- with Atlanta. But Georgia, a modern-day Georgia on the other side of the globe from where we are. So we see a clear progression of the ripple effect in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, in those that are closest to Jesus. Do you see where they were all, they all gave their lives for the gospel? It wasn't in Jerusalem. It wasn't in Judea. It wasn't in Samaria. But they went to the outermost parts of the earth. So we see a concentration of reaching in the city, Acts 1 through 7, in the country, Acts 8 through 12, and the world, Acts 13 through 28. That's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but that is, um, that's the progression that happened, and that's the primary message for today. Now, on a somewhat of a side note, persecution spreads the gospel, folks. And the reason we could talk about this so clearly and understand it a little more clearly today is because we see in the news persecution happening in other parts of the world. And not just persecution like, you're a Christian, what? Don't swear around so-and-so. They're a Christian. Don't you people, don't you hate other people? There's a, it's like what we get in America here, like, right? Like, don't swear around them. They're a Christian. That's not persecution, my friends. Persecution is when they march you and another uh, among a group of men to a beach, and they they behead you. This just happens now. Persecution is when, as a little girl Christian walking to a Bible study, is shot and killed. It's happening today. That's persecution, and persecution spreads the gospel. Prosperity historically has stunted the gospel. The ripple effect, isn't that interesting? Historically, the ripple effect of Christianity, going from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other parts of the world, the ripples seem stronger and go further and make a greater impact when the church is being persecuted, when Christians are being killed for their faith. But when times of prosperity, the ripples kind of, the water gets a little flat again. Not always, but many times. Now, historically, we see that there was this, um, uh, what happens when persecution happens is they're scattered and they're emboldened. 
And as we said before, the disciples were preaching in Jerusalem. The start of the gospel, God knew what he was doing. He knows what he's doing beyond of what we can even figure out because there's so much more to it that we can even put our puny minds around. But we've been revealed enough that we can understand that this, this, uh, this metropolitan area, this area of Jerusalem has all this ethnic background, people coming in from other countries and, and being around. All of a sudden the gospel is preached and all of a sudden they're leaving and going back to their homelands and the gospel is being uh, spread because persecution breaks out and people are running from persecution and they are, uh, they're, they're going throughout the known world and they take the message of Christ with them. It's not much different without the persecution of a dear friend of mine who's up at Kent State University area, and he uh, is running, he's run for the last several years a, uh, a, a church. It's actually become one of our friend's churches up in Kent, and he, he, um, he's from China, and he actually runs, it's a Chinese church, it's, uh, but, it's, uh, but he runs this for students who have come over from China and they're going to Kent State and he runs this fellowship and he shares the gospel. They come into Jesus and then they, their plans are going back to China anyhow. So they go back to China and they take the gospel back to China. Can I just tell you, and I've shared this before up here, I believe is that when it comes to the furthering the gospel, when China comes alive for Jesus Christ, when the Holy Spirit falls upon China like no other time in our, in our country, you will see the gospel. You will see Christianity just boom. The future of Christianity doesn't look like it's necessarily in the United States, but the future of Christianity is in places, blessed places like China, Africa, the Southern Hemisphere. And I tell you what, that's what we need to be praying for. That's what we pray for. Yes, we're we're in America, let's pray for the United States. And let's fight for justice right where we're at and seek for the gospel to go forward. Let's work in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, but in other most parts of the world. Let's encourage the gospel going out, that it prospers throughout the world. Let's pray for that. Let's believe for it. Let's know that God is doing a work throughout the world and not just in our own backyard. So the gospel permeated every culture, even forced Roman Empire, uh, Emperor Constantine to abandon false Roman gods and decriminalize Christianity, declaring it the new state of religion in 313 AD. So almost 300 years after Jesus rose from the dead, the, the known world, the dominated world, which is the Roman world, declared Christianity the state religion, in 300 years, less than 300 years. Before this time, Christians were considered less than human. So let me read for you. If you bear with me, let me read uh, with me. Let's, uh, let me read for you a, a historic account of what was happening to Christians as they went out um, uh, in, in before this time period. Christians suffered from sporadic and localized persecutions over a period of two and a half centuries. Their refusal to participate in the imperial cult was considered an act of treason and was thus punishable by execution. The most widespread official uh, persecution uh, car- uh, was carried out during the great persecution of about 303 to 311. The emperor ordered Christian buildings and the homes of Christians torn down and their sacred books collected and burned. Christians were arrested, tortured, mutilated, burned, and starved, and condemned to glad- uh, gladiatorial contest to amuse spectators. Persecution spreads the gospel, and that's what happened there. So what does this mean for us today? Do we have an obliga- any obligation to fulfill the Great Commission as our brothers and sisters did in the book of Acts? Are we responsible then for the pebble plan as well as the question? I think you know my answer. We've been here before, but we're gonna, it bears repeating, right? Because it's something, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a football team coming together and a uh, oh, better illustration. It's like the Cleveland Cavaliers coming together and even though you've been beat by the Bulls on a last second shot, I don't think that Coach Blatt walks in there with his team and makes up a new strategy. It's the same strategy. Give the ball to LeBron. Right? Can you tell I'm disappointed? 
The, the game plan is the same. Shoot the ball into the basket. Score more points than the other team. Keep them from scoring points. The, the message is still the same to that team for, a winning, for the winning team. And the same thing, I keep, we keep coming back and saying, yes, it's the same call that we begin. The same transformation, the same gospel, and we're called to communicate it. Over and over. So same, same message, but different methods today. And so the great commission of the church is to th- go, therefore go and make disciples. It's intended for us today, for every single Christian. It's the same message, the same, same call that we have upon our lives as it was for them. If you look at the full command, this is what it is. Just so there's clarity. Go and make disciples, share the gospel. Evangelism. Baptize them. A symbolic um, exercise of an outward sign for an inward cleansing and teaching them to obey everything, everything that he commanded us to do, discipleship. He commanded us to do evangelism and discipleship. So if we were given a grade as a church, as, as, as individuals and as a church, what kind of grade would you have? On a scale one to 10, Uh, how would you do? How would we as a church family do? If our greatest call, if your greatest call, and if us as we as a church family, if our greatest call is evangelism and discipleship, how are we graded? How are we doing? It's a big question, isn't it? It kind of, for me, as, as, um, as an individual believer, it sure does cut to the chase when it comes to passion for people who are not yet following Christ, those without transformation in Christ. And as a church, it really helps you evaluate everything you do. It makes you reconsider how much is just done for us to make us comfortable and how much we do that makes us super uncomfortable, but it sure is reaching new people for Jesus and helping them grow in that faith. So if it means, too, that a church, a church family can be accused of, you know, you just don't have quite enough activities going on. If you just did more fun things, people would show up more. If you offered what that church offers down the road, or I read about this one halfway across the nation, that they, what they do, they, they're busy. I think our church family always must ask. Which is, which is best? Just be busy? Does that justify a healthy church? Or is a healthy church reaching new people for Jesus and discipling those people? Reaching new people for Jesus and discipling. And it doesn't always count just being, more, just being busy. But I, I believe firmly it comes down to this. And this is one of the reasons why I'll keep banging this drum. I'll keep banging this drum over and over again. As long as there are people that are dying and going to hell, as long as there's people that are walking around us that are lost and they think they're found, people that are walking around chasing after everything in the world for fulfillment, seeking transformation, they don't even know they're seeking transformation, but they're seeking in so many things and they're hitting dead ends and they're hurting and they're in pain because of ways ways they're trying to fulfill this God-shaped vacuum within their life. And as long as we have that, I'm going to keep banging this drum. And that's the banging the drum of saying that there's love, wholeness, and hope in Jesus Christ through knowing him. There is love, hope, and wholeness through Jesus Christ. And we have the privilege, the opportunity, and the obligation to share that message with everybody into our last dying breath in this life. We have that opportunity and obligation to do so. Can I keep banging that drum? Can I keep banging that drum? You know, because the moment, I'm telling you, the moment that this church family looks at their pastor and said, you know what? You can stop preaching that message. You need to find another pastor. Because I can't pastor a church that doesn't believe this is our highest call right here. Reaching new people, discipling people. 
to his honor and glory and praise. That is our call as a church. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. This is our call. Paul obeyed it. He taught it. We must too as, as well. Finally, here's some practical, some application. The rubber meets the road. What is your Jerusalem, your Judea, Samaria, and your world? I'm going to suggest three things simply. Uh, three things. You want to write them in your notes and what little space you have on your sheet. First one is shine your light. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16 say this about you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Shine your light right where you're at. Wherever that at is, shine your light. Do not hide under a bush, oh no. But shine it all around the world. This little light of mine. So, the second thing is, this is huge. Give grace to all. Give grace to all. Sometimes it's a tough one. Well, not sometimes. This is tough a lot. This is tough to do all the time. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 say, in, humility's value, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. That, my friends, is not a part-time command. But if you want to share the gospel, if you want to see people come to know Jesus and then grow in Jesus, then be a person that people look at and say, man, they see others as more valuable than themselves. They look to others' interests rather than their own. Boy, they're humble. I want to know about their Jesus. Matthew 22, 34 through 40, Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The first and greatest, this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so grace to all means this. Which is better to be accused of? That person stood up for their rights and for justice, and they pointed out right and wrong. People knew where they stood. To be accused of that, or told that, or that person was a person of grace and mercy. That person really loved. And I I do see a difference between the two. And, And my challenge to you is simple. Hug someone that you don't like very well. For some of you, that's hug a liberal. Because I I see what you put on Facebook. and, And that's metaphorical for saying, who is really difficult for you to love and show grace to? And I would say be known as a person of grace, of love, of mercy, And people will come to know Jesus as a result. People will come to know Jesus as a result. And it doesn't mean that we are fickle on what we believe. The Bible's the Bible, you know, the firm, it's firm foundation for us, yes. But the foundation is first and foremost, love the Lord your God with all your your heart and soul and mind and strength. And then the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So I see love as the foundation, not being right. Right? Grace to all. Grace to all. And, and finally, this is my parting shot. 
Seek opportunities right where you are, then go from there. Throw the pebble. You can't have a pebble plan if you don't get the pebble out of your hand. Throw it. Strike the iron so the echo goes out and someone 100 yards, quarter mile down the road looks and sees you striking something and then all of a sudden they wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Oh, there it is. Seek opportunities, throw the pebble. Be discipled and disciple somebody else. Be discipled and disciple someone else. Study the Bible with someone. Don't make it rocket science. Pick a book in the Bible and say, will you sit down with me for just this next four to six weeks? You don't have to marry someone. You may be married to that person, but you, you're, if you're already married, you don't have to marry another person to be a discipler or to be discipled, but sit down with someone and actually walk through the Bible, walk through some parts of the Bible, grab a study from Lifeway bookstores, keep them in business or off Amazon, whatever you choose to do, but do something, do something. I, I made the suggestion of this uh, the study that I, I started open service with. Um, excellent study if you're interested in that. We'll, we'll even get you a copy. We'll help you find copies and sit down with someone and just go through that and encourage someone else and be encouraged by someone else. Be discipled. Make disciples. Do something. Throw the pebble. Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3 says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you. His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Shine your light. Watch the ripple effect from your investment in your community, in your broader area, both those who are like you and those who are not like you, and then to the rest of the world. Now, I tell you, this is a typical example. This is the end. This is, I'm done right there. But I know that at the end of a sermon like this, you, you, I know, you, even though I went just, I just went like 40 minutes, 45 minutes on that sermon, and we are done. But I know that a sermon like this, you could walk away and go, I just, she would just give me more, and not a longer sermon, but just, Give me, give me more. And I'm just telling you right now, you're not stupid people. I know, I've been watching you, most of you. I, I think you figure this out. You can figure it out. You all have a local Jerusalem. You have a Judea and Samaria. You have an uttermost parts of the earth. There are missionaries that we have within our movement of evangelical friends that need your financial support. They need your prayer support. We have this whole wall committed out there. And I know that when things appear on the wall, decoration, isn't that nice? And at first you're like excited, but then after a while it all becomes numb to you. It does me too. But there are missionaries on that wall uh, globally that you can connect with, EFM, connect with Evangelical Friends Mission, some of our uh, Evangelical Friends Eastern Region, the missionaries, outermost parts of the earth. And then we have another part of the wall out there that have several ministries that are our, our Judea and Samaria represented. Those are the ones that we've chosen to connect with so that we can focus on few, so we can have a bigger impact as a church family. But you may have some that you know that you can uh, pour into. And I'm telling you, don't just get involved with a social gospel, uh, just a social gospel thing. That it's, it's, yes, it's important to feed people. Do that. But if you just feed without sharing the gospel in some time, you're missing, you're missing it. They're going to go away hungry and go to hell. That sounds kind of harsh, I know, but, it's, but you want to give them the, the living water. You know, if they're thirsty, give them a glass of water. They're not going to thirst for that moment, but you want to give them the living water, right? So invest in that message. Be a clear communicator of the gospel. And then uh, I'm telling you, share your faith this week with someone. Some of you have been praying for, for that same person over and over again. This is how you fill in the blanks. This is how you walk away from a sermon and go, yeah, I just, I wish you would have been more practical. I wish you told us just a little bit more. Fill in the blanks. Share your faith. Let's see people come to know Jesus. Let's have the ripple effect go out. Will you stand with me?
God, we pray right now for those folks within our lives that are um, without you. That um, they've been ignoring you. They, they may not even have a clarity on exactly what the gospel message is. And we pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you will come and that you will set upon them right where they're at. I know, I know from conversations, I know that there are folks within uh, this church family here that, are saying, that, that have people that they're burdened for. And they've actually been sharing the gospel. In more than one way, there's folks, I know folks here, God, that are verbally share and through their actions just love people and are people of grace. God, we pray that you will break through those obstacles, those walls, those boundaries. We pray for the people within our Jerusalem, right around us in our world. We pray for the Judea and Samaria, just a little further out in our greater area, and those that are not like us, but we have an opportunity to share the gospel. And God, we do pray for our missionaries, those that are considered our missionaries, those in the mission field, but God, those that are directly connected to us. We pray that your gospel will go forward, that many people will come to know you as a result. May we be encouragers of one another in this, um, this call to put the, put the ball in the hoop, to score more points than the other team. Help us to stay diligent and not become stale, not try to invent different things to keep our faith interesting, to keep church life attractive. God, we will not um, bow to that temptation, but we will continue to bang the drum. We choose to bang the drum. In the name of Jesus, we pray all of this. Amen. Go with God and be at peace.